set the proceedings in, in motion. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Let me very briefly introduce myself for those of you who may not have come across me and indeed the project that I initiated, namely Insiders Outsiders, which started off life as a real life nationwide year long arts festival designed to pay tribute in this instance rich and diverse contribution made by refugees from Nazi dominated Europe to this country's culture. But as part of that, I was very much intent on letting the so-called second generation have their voice in relation to those complex, rich, but often troubled histories. And I'm glad to say, well, not really glad, but because of COVID, we went online and it's unexpectedly perhaps given the festival a rich afterlife in the form of online events such as this, where indeed members of the second and sometimes the third generations are able to have a platform under the umbrella of Insiders Outsiders. So it's my very great pleasure as the director of that project to welcome you all tonight. A few practical things, boring, boring, but they need to be done. Let me just admit a few more people in the meantime. Um, could you please all now mute yourselves so there's no background interference noise. Um, we will be having the Q&A in the first instance via the chat, but I would ask you please, please to direct the chat to me, Monica Bomducci, and not to everyone because it's too distracting for our two main speakers tonight. Um, the event will be recorded, so if you don't want to be seen at all uh, for posterity, then you might want to turn off your videos, or indeed, actually, if you don't mind doing that anyway, it tends to increase the um, broadband quality, which can only be um, a good thing. Um, what else? Um, I think that'll probably do by way of practicalities. Um, let me just now, again, briefly introduce our two participants. Um, fine, so Annie Freud, first of all, a poet, translator, teacher, editor, and painter, and uh, renowned as perhaps you've already had a sort of <laughs> a hint of for her live performances. And I'm sure we're all looking forward to seeing Annie in action, reading some of her work. Um, her first collection was called The Best Man That Ever Was, was published by Picador in 2007, and received a Poetry Book Society recommendation, and was also awarded the Dimplex Prize for New Writing. The Mirabelles, Picador, 2010, was a Poetry Book Society choice and was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize. Her third collection was The Remains, also published by Picador in 2015, and that also received a reward from the Poetry Book Society, so many, many awards, many prizes. Hiddensee, I think I'm pro pronouncing it as it should be in German, was published in January this very year. It's her fourth collection. Uh, let me move on also briefly to Jacqueline, who will be her um, interlocutor. I'm not sure if that's quite the right word. Um, Jacqueline Safra, also a prize winning poet. Her collections include the following The Kitchen of Lovely Contraptions. These are wonderful, wonderful names. <laughs> if I lie on my back, or if I lay on my back, I saw nothing but naked women. And All My Mad Mothers. Great titles. Uh, two of her sonnet sequences, uh, A Bargain with the Light, Poems After Lee Miller, and Veritas, Poems After Artemisia. Gentileski, are published by Hercules Editions, and her most recent collections are Dad, Remember You Are Dead, 2019, and 100 Lockdown Sonnets from this year. Uh, she's a founder member of Poets for the Planet, lives in London, and teaches at the Poetry School. So without further ado, I will make myself both invisible and mute and, yes, disappear and hand over to you, Jacqueline, perhaps to set the ball rolling. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, and let me give the floor to you. Great honour to be, um, I don't even know how to say that word, interlocutor to, um, to Annie. It's, uh, it feels a bit like interrogator, but um, we have had some great uh, conversations preparing for this evening, and um, I think you're in for a real treat. I wish we had 24 hours to explore Annie's book, which is immense in its scope and its reach, um, but we don't, we have about 45. So I'm going to get stuck right in and say, um, we could begin, I think, Annie, by talking about the tradition that you're writing out of and into, um, the European tradition, and how timely that, that your book is um, in our current political circumstances with Brexit and everything. Um, so I'm just going to briefly say something about the book so people can locate themselves in it if they haven't read it. And if you haven't read it, buy a copy. Um, it's in three sections, and the first section travels huge distances. There are poems about identity, about belonging and not belonging, about the nature and process of being an artist, a visual artist and a poet, poems about love and language, history, philosophy and religion, you know, the world and everything in it and all the people, um, and a lot of very colourful characters too. 
Um, so that's the sort of first longish section. There's a short section in the middle, which is called Cancer Poem. I, I guess it's a, you know, it's a powerful journey into mortality and meditations on mortality. And that leads us quite nicely into the third section, which um, uh, consists of translations of Jacques Tournay's poem, which, um, as Annie says in, in the afterword, are all about the trauma of being human, which in a way is, I guess, what all poetry is about. But I think Annie's poetry also focuses a lot on that. The big themes of life and mortality and the sacred and the nature of art and, you know, all those, all those massive subjects that a small poem can actually encompass. So um, we're going to start off by talking about the title poem, um, which um, Annie is going to pronounce for us beautifully. Go, Annie. Hidden Zee. Hidden Zee. And um, Monica, if you wouldn't mind putting up the map, which is image three, that would be really useful. A minute. Yeah, the next one. Yeah, yes, next one. one. Sorry, image two it is, not image three. That's it. So that's the island. Um, okay, okay. Uh, Jackie, thank you. That is love, a lovely introduction. It makes me feel super calm, which is required at such events. Now, if you look at this map, um, you will see on the almost sort of the, 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 the middle of the screen, but towards the top, an island that looks like it's shaped like a seahorse. Got it? Yeah. Um, it's long and thin. And um, it's a rather remarkable place. It's some, uh, it's a few hours from Hamburg towards the south west and you can take a train or drive and when you arrive on Stralsund you then go under the island of, of I think it's called Regen, Regen, that's right and then you, if you have a car, you park your car you get onto the ferry and there's this lovely, you know, what is it, there's something very special about ferries. And when you cross the sea, you arrive at this um, little harbour and uh, there are no cars on Hidden Zee, only the doctor has a car. And you will find uh, in the car park uh, metal trolleys, and that's where you put your luggage. They're, na they're named for the hotel or guest house or wherever you're planning to stay. And you load your get baggage onto one of these trolleys and you trundle through the streets. They're always sandy. They're, there's a soft wind blowing and the streets are sort of have a blowing sand to them. And then you arrive at your 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 stopping point where you will be where you will sleep and you will eat and you will have sauna and you will shower and you will eat strange fish that you've never eaten before and is that your grandmother's house that the place that you're talking about yes yes my grandmother um my mother's father had a small house uh, a rented, a rented cottage on Hidden Zay, right near the harbour. It no longer exists now, and uh, it's a, it's a bit of a story. But um, I found this photo in one of her albums, and I, it was clear to me that given the date of the photograph, because everything was very annotated, that this may have been a photograph taken when she knew that she would have to leave her native land and live out. Can we, can we see, shall we have a look at the, about the, at the photograph of the house now, Annie? Would this be a yes, good moment? Yes, absolutely, I'd love um, to. Monica, that's the fifth one, yeah. There we go. Okay. So it was a, it was a rough little house. My grandfather, being an architect, um, transformed the inside um, it was uh, there was the uh, the the notion of 
uh, simplicity and minimalism in terms of its influent, influence on modernism was, a, was very much a German invention. The idea of the sort of humble abode as a place of, I don't know, spectacular elegance, if you like. And yet it was also a place where children rough and tumbled. And I found the photograph in one of my grandmother's albums and it occurred to me that this was a subject for a painting. This painting took me 500 hours of work. I don't begrudge a second. I think just before you go on, just to say that's really interesting in the light of what we're going to talk about later and why I am a painter, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the poems in the book again. Mm -hmm. Um, is relevant to what you're just talking about thank, now. Thank you for so cleverly and moving. <laughs> shall we? Shall we um, hear the poem? It's it's a longish poem, but it is it's also a narrative poem, um, owing something to the epic, I believe, um, but not entirely epic. Yes, absolutely. I would love to read it. Hidden Zay, nineteen thirty-three. She would have turned to face the little house, and in that moment, on that summer's day, would have seen the composition as a whole. Thin curtains flapping at the windows, the shingle roof casting its crenellated shadow on the whitewashed wall, with deep-set rustic doors. The leaves of the sweet chestnut, almost black against the sky, the tin bath, laundry bucket and washboard, broom draped with a cloth like a turban socialite, slippers propped on the step, the bicycle lying where it fell, familiar characters in a children's story, conversing on the cobbles and rough grass, the news was bad and getting worse. People she had known were being murdered where they stood and no one was saying anything. She would have run inside to grab her camera and clicked. All summer the boys had fished and fought. Soon she would be packing up and leaving home for good. And there she was, removed to St John's Wood, buying carrots in a German accent, too afraid to ask for directions on the underground and surfacing at Harrow instead of Baker Street from where she'd hoped to make her way to Swan and Edgar, with its thin-chested serving girls and air of dank refinement to buy the vests and pants her boys would need for school. She thought her vert times on Leipziger Platz, where women arm in arm decided what to spend their husband's money on its palmy tea rooms, where they would while away the afternoon, exchanging indiscretions with their friends. The wide imperial sweep of Regent Spark, Arctic, bare, was nothing like the garlanded footpaths of the tear garden. Students French kissing under the linden trees, and she was no longer the smooth-skinned idealistic woman she had been, posing in shorts, leaning on a shrimping net, or kneeling like a soulful mermaid on the sand before a time would come when she'd forget her soul. Farewell, great Herodotus and Homer. Farewell, Pindar, Apuleius and his golden ass, her study, her distinction and her pride. The scholar became the model of the perfect housefrau, acting surprised at other people's cleverness. Hello, dreary house of Windsor, rations at the grocer's. Hello to the general vileness of the English class system and its prohibitions. She collected English sayings and would deliver them apropos of nothing in an arched declamatory tone, even acquiring their shadow versions, so that is he or isn't he became is he or is he. 
hearing her furnace, I cringed as children cringe. She had a way of looking at me that only just refrained from asking what was really going on, like the time she asked me to describe the flat where we had moved on the occasion of my mother's second marriage. I explained that instead of doors, each room was connected to the other by a ladder and a chute, with small openings at ceiling level, and that is how we moved around, and when she next was speaking to my mother, asked her to elaborate. Did she imagine false walls, hiding families of Jews, packed in together against a hammering at midnight on the door? What was really going on was that I resisted her desire to form a picture of what this new life of mine was like. On a peninsula on the easternmost edge of the Suffolk coast, she found a way of being old and more content, a kind of fitting in with English ways, buying pigeons from the poacher, knocking at the back door, befriending the postmistress, taking a sixpenny ferry across the River Bly, the swaying grass, the long flat shore, reminded her of Hiddensee, the old house, the floorboards gritty with sand, sudden swimsuits flung down, the imperious demands of sons, cobbling together whatever was on hand to make a supper, going blissfully to bed after such a summer's day. Last year, I dined on perch bike at the Hotel Godavind on Hidden Zay, bought a teacup slanted in allusion to the dissipated life of dissidents, dissidents and renegade Berliners. I watched migrating cranes stream overhead, admired a frieze of Jugendstil design, a flash of blue and yellow between the stunted pines, and trudged its heathland wastes among other slow-paced walkers speaking in hushed tones. The chestnut tree still stood, the house had fallen down and been replaced. Everyone was living in the past. You may, may, you, you may ask, what was her weapon? And looking back, I have this to say, the merciless filling of our stomachs with kugelhoop, schnitzel, pancakes stuffed with sweetened curds, Eels floating in a green broth, linzer tort, servalat, liverwurst, the eldest son's triumphant roadkill, hit by his three wood Messerschmitt. Trespassers will be prosecuted, was a signpost she most loved to flout. She showed me how to stoop under barbed wire and dart among the shuddering beech trees a white feather spiralling down into my open hand to be threaded later by its quill. Next to the jays, striped pink and black and blue, the speckled thrushes, the woodpeckers, the starlings, the ravens, the pheasants and the turtle doves into the curtain in the kitchen window. Annie, um, thank you. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've read that poem myself, uh, but of course, hearing you read it, it, it takes on all kinds of extra dimensions. And I get such a very much stronger sense of the character of your grandmother, actually. And, uh, and um, thinking about the theme of these, um, of these readings, the inside and outside thing, I was sort of very struck by the, the wonderful humour of buying carrots in a German accent. Um, at the beginning, compared to um, buying pigeons from the poacher later on, um, and these, these kind of parallels that seem to keep appearing um, through the whole poem. Um, tell us um, maybe a little bit, you know, given the theme of this, of this event, how, the, how you approach or how you think about the Holocaust in, in the context of a poem like this, because you kind of circle it 
you don't really go there, but it's very present in the poem. Well, you know, you couldn't go there. You couldn't go there. I was little. Um, all I cared was to go to the beach and find prey. I was a very predatory child. I loved to see wild, wild little fishes swimming in the pools around the, the ancient pier. One day I found a plover's egg in a warm depression in the gravel. Um, I, it's only until, I mean, I knew somehow that was sort of a Jew. And one of the, one of the things I find really, really kind of strange is that these days the word Jew is still a very difficult word to say. Um, I don't mean to say, I, I mean, I'm not interested in sort of erecting any sort of hierarchy of this or that, but it's a very uneasy word and I hesitate greatly um, in terms of saying it. And it's partly to do with my 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 ignorance, both determined by my antecedents and both chosen by myself. Um, but I'm not... You said to me, this, when we were talking, you said this wonderful thing about if you're a Jew, you're either too Jewish or, or not Jewish enough. Um, and that certainly resonated with me. And I think, you know, for those of us who, who come from these kind of bohemian, um, artistic, like secular backgrounds, it's quite it's, yeah. it's a difficult identity to, to take on. It's a very difficult identity because, I mean, if you go to sort of like seders and stuff like mm. that, um, uh, sort of very kind of reformed seders, they're not yeah. ordinary reformed Jews, they're, they're, they're people, they're millennials who have tried to connect themselves with their Jewish identity mm -hmm. and to have ceremonies that while they acknowledge the past respect all the present and for me uh, in my I only began to understand anything the meagrest thing about this in my late 30s to mm -hmm. do with the closeness and encouragement of important friends mm -hmm. I hope I Sorry, Annie, go on. I, I mean, I'm... And, and one of the things also that um, as I uh, so approach middle age, I'm, 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 re I'm not a good party, but... Uh, no, I love a party. But when it's a massive party, where there are 200, maybe 150 people, I don't function terribly well. But one of the things that I've sort of noticed about myself in a bizarre way, is sometimes I do, I'm a big social gathering and I feel mysteriously comfortable and I suddenly realise there's an awful lot of Jews there. <laughs> well, that sort of leads us on very nicely, a very, very nice segue into the next poem, which is, um, I'm um, looking forward to hearing you read um, Immortality for Jewish Girls, um, yeah. which is about part of the pub life, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me just... Okay, I'll read the poem first and I'll give you a little bit of spiel afterwards. Is that all right? Okay. Yep, that's perfect. Immortality for Jewish girls. I used to think I was good at drink, pub life and a swinging dawn, waving a tenor with a meaningful look, versatile, opinionated, gregarious, always with a funny story, and an unexpected request for Angostura bitters in my Pinot Grigio. In these latter days, as the sky darkens at four and the wind blows the wet leaves airborne, the promise of alcohol dews my lip and I look back on the Rosendale, the Bedford, the Samuel Beckett and the Shakespeare. The blue posts, the old ship's double entrance, and the old Shalala's double barn. The sun where we foregathered, and the blacksmith's head where we got married. The cock tavern, the wheat sheaf, and the coach and horses, with its Richard Harris lookalikes, 
I'm still telling you the same old story. I mean, one of the wonderful things about that poem is the kind of incantatory quality of those names that you that you roll out in the way that you do, um, and, and they have a kind of beauty, um, and, and a, they evoke uh, so much in such a, a you know brief period of time. Do you just want to talk a little bit about the use of names in your poems generally? Because you do yeah, this a lot, yeah. even the Angostura bitters, right? You know. <laughs> kind of... Well, I kind of snuck that in to kind of like epate le bourgeois. <laughs> well, to me, to me, you've only got to say a name and a door opens. Um, uh, Liza Minnelli. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyone, you, you say a name, you say a name and there's a, a sense of a, a sort of marvellous panorama on the life of somebody who strove. Yes, I mean, um, I can see all those pubs when you talk about them. And those pubs were things where re things really happened. <laughs> uh, you know, I remember the sun where after our... I was in the John Stammers group for a long time. And after our sessions, we would go and just invade the place. And it was... Um, it's, um, there's some people lost from that time. Mm -hmm. Susan Grindley, who is my darling, amazing friend, who I still mourn. I remember Susan Grindley as a lovely, lovely woman and actually a very fine and witty poet. Oh, um, and totally, totally uh, located in the canon. Mm, I think so. Um, I just, so let's just let's just move back to the the subject of the the use of names and which leads nicely onto the use of sound in your poems I think because they're very carefully and subtly built so they're not you know obviously metric they don't have rhymes in them and yet the music is very very apparent in the poem um, and you were going to read us Rambo's ovaries but but tell us a bit about the Mondegreen and how you use that to okay. create this poem before you read it so that we can hear it when you do. Okay, well, this poem is this poem is totally dedicated to John Sayers. When you are a writer and you're invited to do an event, um, because one's own personal judgment can be, I don't know, too fearful or whatever, it's wonderful to have a um, someone to help you. John Sayers was the, the most remarkable curator I've ever experienced in terms of his precision. And I remember at Winchester when we left the hotel, which was modelled, I mean, it had once been a prison, so it was called something like the dungeon. <laughs> and we had worked together for weeks and we had breakfast and he turned to me as we left for the taxi to get into town. Focus. Now, he told me a story um, about an experience where he had, where he was, I think, leading a group. And um, one of the participants mentioned, in a sort of passing way, he meant to say, um, somewhere over the rainbow and because we're all sort of like kind of uh sort of sliding between different realities instead he said rambo's ovaries now i've told john about this story twice he has not the slightest memory <laughs> telling me this so i felt gifted with these beautiful letters and i wrote a poem consisting only of the letters in Rambo's ovaries. And just before Annie starts to read it, you can really hear the sounds of these letters, which magically create all this music, these repeated sounds as, as you listen to the poem. Birds move abroad, sad armies raid armoires, suave eros dorms, a morbid vase. Admires ordure, bids a rose adieu, murder 
Sire's murder, buries Obad's news. A dossier, massive, abrasive, biased, arise. Boom. Odium's rude brass marauds our ears. Bravado rams demur aside. Idioms embarrass us. A rabid virus devours a biomass as Ovid's rubied rivieras void bruised bodies overboard a saria brim. Mm -hmm. I think you can really get a sense of the, the full range of what Annie's capable of when you compare that to Hidden Fate at the, that, that she read at the beginning. You know, that, that long narrative character building poem compared to this, which shows something a bit to Ulipo, I think. Um, uh, and it's just so beautifully kind of musical and evocative. And I think understanding that it, you know, it, it's an anagrammatic poem um, is, is a really interesting thing to know about it. You might not pick up. You also said to me that it has the same metric structure as the as the second coming, the eighth poem. Is that yes, is, well, that not the actual thing? beginning, because I I thought, hey, fuck, I better check. <laughs> but um, the you know, um, I've got my eight somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we don't need to look at it now. But yeah. if anyone in there in there. Um, Spare time want to get a copy of Annie's book and compare this poem to to the eighth. I think that's a really interesting one. Okay, I, I'm um, sorry. That's, that's too much junk around for me to sort of start no, 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 carrying around. No, it's fine. I just wanted to drop that in because yeah. I would never no, realised no, 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 it. You exactly. told me. And this is this is the pleasure of being in this kind of event is that you can find out all these things about how how the poems happen. So um, moving on a bit, let's we can talk a little about a, a bit about protest here because. You, when we were talking about this event, you said this wonderful thing to me, which I've been quoting to everybody. You said, my poems are byproducts of the experience of writing. My poems are byproducts of the experience of writing, which I thought was so beautiful and so true and so um, resonated so much with me that I know things are really cooking when it's the pro all about the process yeah. and nothing to do with the end result. So, um, in terms of this this book and how it evolved, can you talk a bit about that, about process and byproduct? Yeah, products? well, um, a few years ago, my husband, Dave, was diagnosed with cancer. And it was an incredibly tough time. And one of the things that happened to me, that has never happened to me as a writer, is that I experienced with tremendous guilt and also desperate exhilaration was something called flow. And it was as if my poems were like thoroughbred racehorses waiting for the steeplechase to start in their little metal cages. And you know, there was the you know, the sort of flat cap flat app bloke with the start thing. Um, I don't know if they still exist anymore. But it was like the, the the thought of a big loss and 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 and, and death and and prognosis and the rest of it just lit a kind of fire under me, and um, it was a very strange, difficult and marvelous time, which you can see in that book, um, and that leads us again. Beautiful segue. Um, you said something about what you, you said to me that that being a poet is about writing poetry, and um, you yeah, get the book well, in the end. To me, but, to me, yeah. Oh, okay, to answer your question properly, mm -hmm. I mean, it's very nice to have a book out. I'm hugely grateful. I worked hard on that book, but to me, the whole point of writing and being a poet is to write poems. And when I get a day where I can do one. That's, that's the point of it. I mean, that's what I hope for all the time. I mean, you can't have it all the time. You just can't. Because the subject matter has decided that you're not ready to approach it uh, in the way that you have decided for yourself. 
and will become a bit sort of ret ret reticent about allowing you to enter. But then something called the zone. The zone. I know it well. I'm always looking for it, Annie. I'm always waiting. Sometimes for that you get lifted on the bus with a zone <laughs> in a conversation with a friend or somebody intimate, and you there's a there's a sense that you're on a uh, you're on a route that has consequences for yourself and other people. Yes, yes. Um, and you, you've written about the about the process, about the artistic process in this book. In fact, as your, yourself as a visual artist in that poem, um, uh, why am why I am a painter. Um, so, would you like to talk a bit about that before you read it, or would you like to read it first? No, I'll talk about it first. Mm -hmm. um, Do you want the image, the George Stubbs image? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Monica, could you put up image seven? It's the George Stubbs image of the horses. No, there we just went past. Yeah, yeah. there we go. Okay. Um, I'm... Oh, go on, Annie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I um, I've always painted with varying degrees of self-belief what and um i've been painting um in what you can say is a serious way uh for some 10 years and not so long ago i was invited by um uh the somebody who had um, a charity for um that helps uh, very young people and ex-offenders recover from the trauma that led them there. And I was invited to make this painting and I thought there was no better, there's no better model than George Stubbs. And I made this painting in response to his quite magnificent painting. Mm -hmm. and. I wrote this poem as a consequence. Oh, good. In this phase of my life, I am unable to be serious about much else. Now I'm in bed, I think about the puppet show of Moby Dick I saw last October in a corrugated hut, and when the sail of the tattooed ship unfurled on a hinge. We were on the rolling seas and Queequeg's yojo jigged on the deck and the great white whale hung down in the spot the harpoon was in every scene of Ahab's questless few. Which of these and which I'll keep I have yet to decide. I'd be unfaithful to everything that's dear for the sake of my painting. I don't even appreciate the scrambled eggs on my plate. I love the infinite pains, the near madness it takes to paint the slope of a roof, the feeling of intoxication. I love being deliberate having accents. I love it even when it's hopeless. Sometimes I'll say, look at that rose. Nothing could be more arresting. I must admit it's only when the subject's already in my mind can I be asked. And next is Fez, its pockmarked walls and myriad windows like eye sockets, its crenellations, zinc roofs and cobalt rhomboids, the suggestion of an inner courtyard. And when I take four paces back to appraise my work, I feel the apertures of my pupils expanding and contracting in real time. And this is how it comes to me that lack of quality 
is itself a measure of quality and that makes all the difference. I hold up my palette knife to steady myself, take infinitesimal quantities of paint, mix them slowly at first and then faster until the consistency is perfect before leaning into the picture. Mm. An avid description of process, that, that poem is really, I feel like I'm in there with you, although I can't paint, I must say. I love it, I love it that you say, I love it even when it's hopeless. I mean, I think that is part of the process, isn't it? That, that you know, that you do, you love all of it. You love the bits that work and the bits that don't. And maybe in a way, that lack of quality as a measure of quality is the most exciting bit of the creative process. And I think everything around that subject is, is rolled into this poem. Um, and the other thing I want to say about the poem and your poetry generally is that I don't know anyone else who can mix the, um, a, a, such an elegance of expression with the demotic and it all kind of works together. I love that when you say, can't, I can't be asked. And then you start going on about crenellations. You know, those, those things kind of meeting yeah. in the same piece of art is, is funny, it's, it's human, it's real, and it, you know, it's fabulous. Anyway, I'm going to stop um, fangirling a bit now. Um, are, we, are, you, are you happy to move on? Did you want to say anything else? Oh, about God, that? take me anywhere you want to take me. Okay, okay. So I'm going to take you to that middle section of the book, which is a kind of pivot, I think, between the between the first section and the third. It's a short section. There are not that many poems in it, but it's there's kind of something at the same time as it being cancer poems. There is something powerfully medicinal in these poems, in the directness of them, um, especially when it's surrounded by those other more allusive poems and elusive poems in the collection. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about how these poems arrived before you read us one? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, you, you said a bit at the beginning, I know already, you've already spoken a bit about, well, about the diagnosis and how that led to the poem. Um, well, um, it was... Um, 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 it was it was a huge blow. It was also a, sort of a stimulus to certain kind of romantic feelings. Um, about that, I don't want to say more. Um, but um, it meant that um, uh, a withholding of uh, the expression of traumatic incident meant that moments together took on a slightly different tenor. Mm. And um, I think one of the interesting things about this poem that you're going to read on the shortness of life is that it's one of the ones that is, is written in both French and English. Yes. So you've, kind of, you've kind of translated your own poem into both languages. Um, and so I thought you could read us um, on, on the shortness of life in both in, both in English and Shall French. Shall I start with the English? Yeah, start with the English one, yeah. Okay. On the shortness of life, this is a, a title taken from Seneca, uh, a, Rome, a, Roman poet, a Roman writer of great importance. I have read his book, but I can't remember a word of it. On the shortness of life, we're being put to the test. These days, it's an early start to show willing to escape our nightmares. We meet at the kettle, and then it's back to the daily grind, whatever. The cats settle themselves accordingly, show their us their striped backs, then leave to hunt mice. Butter melts in the pan, and slowly the yolks cover themselves in their white veils. In the days to come, be there, be there. Put your sweater on against the cold. We'll get there, step by step. La brièveté de la vie. Nous voici devant l'épreuve. Ces jours-ci, on se lève tôt pour paraître vide, d'échapper au cauchemar. On se croise à la bouilloire, 
puis on se remet à la tâche quotidienne, quelle qu'elle soit. Les chats se placent selon leur gré, nous montrent leur dos à rayures, puis s'en vont à la chasse aux souris. Un morceau de peur fond dans la poêle, et lentement les jaunes se couvrent d'un deuil blanc. Dans les jours qui suivent, sois là, sois là. Mets ton chandail contre le froid. Pas à pas, on y arrivera. It's, it's so interesting listening to both those versions because they, they really do both sound like the same poem, um, which you don't, you, you sometimes don't get that with translations, but, it, it, you know, it's the, the atmosphere and the mood around those poems is so similar. Um, and I think that leads us quite well onto the last section of the book, which is these translations of Jacques Cornet's poems. And obviously you have, a, you have a strong affinity with European languages and getting back to this kind of insider outsider uh, theme and the idea of the emigre or the immigrant and you know, how that all fits into your, um, your mission. Would you like to talk a bit about that before we hear something? Yes, well, this translation? Um, up until the age of 15, I had really a French education. I was educated from the age of five to 15 at the Lycée Francais de Londres. And it was only within the last years that we had English teachers who introduced us to English literature. So I was, I mean, there was never any discussion or analysis um, in, my, in my lessons about the meanings of the poets that we studied. Rosa, Lamartine, um, Alfred de Vigny, uh, uh, Henri Regnier. But we were taught them as texts to learn by heart. And we were expected to come to the lesson with these poems learnt by heart. So they are deeply embedded in me in a way that I would, I, I, um, I feel privileged to have. Um, so a few years ago, I think it was 2016, um, I was invited to um, a literary festival in Tallinn, in Estonia. Um, a remark remarkable experience. You know, often when you get invited to do a gig at a festival, you expect it to like show up, uh, you get your, you short, sort out your bits and bobs, you dot your I's, you cross your T's, you do your gig, and then you're expected to, well, frank, frankly, bugger off. Because, the, but this festival is a different festival. You are made welcome in this country about which not a lot is known you are introduced to the recent um, socio-political environment. Um, you are fed to the gunnels. Um, you have to walk miles over desperate cobbled footpaths through the town. You are invited to be a reader in desperate uh, uh, three, four hour long poetry sessions where there are Poles and uh, Russians and Finnish and Italians and Spanish all reading while massive plates of soup are passed over your head and huge <laughs> steins of lager uh, are also dripping on you. <laughs> oh, um, that's so wonderful. And I was sitting there with feeling so ignorant listening to these poets until suddenly an unassuming man got up and began to read his poems in French. And there was in the room a sudden quieting of the hubbub that accompanies these kinds of events. And for me, I was transported back to my early youth and my 
formation in the, the canon of French poetry. And we became, over a conversation in the museum, friends. And later he sent me his books, I sent him my books. And um, I had the idea of translating his work. And with his help, he was the most, just to call Jacques Tournay laid back, is to talk about the Pope's Catholicism. Like, you know, I would say I have found a certain um, um, way of communicating a phrase in one of your poems. And although it was wildly wide of the mark, his sweetness and generosity. I'm just, I just asked Monica to put the picture of Tournay up there. Well, there that's you know. Jacques, Jacques. And um, he... And some of my translations were published in um, Poetry London, Modern Poetry in Translation, and a couple of other places. And he fell ill, and he had a very grave cancer, and he died, and... Um, I don't know the, the 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 amazing stimulus of having worked with him mm. Um, mm. Uh, gave me uh, an ambition about how this poet, not known enough widely enough in the greater world, that I regard as a poet of world importance, could be made known to the wider world. Well, that's a very great cue to read one of his poems. And I think you're going to read today's observations, aren't you? Are you yes. going to read it in French and in English? No, I'll just read it in English, I think, to give people a bit of time. OK. And I might make a comment or two at the end. Great. Today's observations. May has come early. The desert within me has lifted. And each face I meet instantly reminds me of another. Some of us are cogitating on a feasible answer, a sworn promise to lessen the distance between us, a pledge to keep our eyes open. In the park, a boy armed with a stick marks out a diamond and lies down on it, staring up at the forget-me-not blue of the sky. I round up square roots, follow whatever curve that tries to drag me to all that is most strange. From the thoughts that waft over me, I choose the most delectable. The hum of roses makes me turn my head towards its provenance. I am helpless in front of their charm. The shadow etched in the ground assures their immortality. I smile at myself in shop windows as if watched by some illustrious nobody fancily got up. I come and go, enlivened by thoughts, a blend of the lofty and humdrum in the courtly dance that has become my habit. I comfort myself with two or three ideas, mellowing like the downy peach on the dresser this morning. Thank you. I think we, we need that pause even when we're on a Zoom, don't we, at the end of a poem like that, at the end of any wonderful poem. Um, just before you say anything else about it, can I just invite people, please, to put, if you've got any questions for Annie, put them in the chat, and then Monica will come back and and um, and put some of your questions, to Annie. But what did, what did you want to say about the about today's observations, particularly, Annie? Well, when I was translating this poem, because it appeared to me initially to have a sort of 
semi-political import. The phrase, the phrase, nous sommes plusieurs à chercher une solution probable. I felt that it was like a, a fellowship of people who saw what was happening in the world wanting to uh, engage in a certain remedy. Can you, just, can you just give the translation of the English translation of that yes, line yes. The for people who don't? Who so, don't uh, it was a very difficult thing to address. Some of us are cogitating on a feasible answer, a sworn promise to lessen the distance between us, a pledge to keep our eyes open. And initially I thought it was a kind of paean to fellow writers to say, we've got to look out for the world. We're in shit. But the, what I began to realize was it could be equally, and this is one of, this is one of Jacques Tonnet's remarkable things, excuse me, is that what the poem might also be simply saying is uh, to his dear ones, also fellow writers, we mustn't make it so long when we, you know, when people have share a, a, a sort of passion and they don't see each other often enough and they must commit to being together more and to sharing time. And so it seemed, so for me, it was like, a, it was what Jacques does is that he presents without any sense of ambiguity, which is most interesting, but a sense of the simul of simultaneously putting on a line of the most apparent banality, something big and grand without ever suggesting that it may be so. Mm. So, you well, know, we haven't seen each other for nine months. It's a shame. Well, we're going to get together, you know. Uh, we shall book the place and you'll come and we're going to have a great time and drink something special. But it's not just that. But there isn't... See, there's a very interesting thing in Shark's work about the ambiguity that isn't. His work is not ambiguous. The two meanings, and there are countless spectacular examples of the two meanings sitting very comfortably, because he liked to be a comfortable man on the same line. Thank you, and I think um, that you know, often great poetry does that, isn't it? It, it has it has these multiple layers and these things sort of coexisting and working together. His poems have it, and you know, as we've had so do yours. Um, so I, I'm going to stop now and hand things over to Monica. But thank you very much, Annie, for um, educating me through this process of, of coming to, to do this this um, event together. It's been a great pleasure. And really and lovely. You, and you have been me. you have been assiduous and remarkable, and this is why I chose you. <laughs> Thank you, bless you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Over you to Monica now. Both of you. Um, fine. We've had lots of compliments coming in, but actually, surprisingly, few questions. Perhaps them yeah. while the rest of you are thinking of things you might want to ask. Um, I could put one to you, Annie, for starters. Um, I wasn't aware, um, but I'm not surprised. You know by your intimate knowledge of French literature, I didn't realise that you went to the lycée in your early days. I'm curious to know something about your relationship with German literature, given your family background. Oh, well, my relationship, um, I was brought up to be ferociously anti-German. Mm. My father once repudiated a dear friend because he bought his daughter who was coming of age a Volkswagen 
<laughs> when I was in my mid-twenties, by some mistake of my direction, I find myself travelling through the Black Forest and experience a, an absurd terror and had to get out of the country immediately. But there was a period in my life, particularly to do with some tenants I had, Kai and Antia, where my love for uh, German culture and literature um, began to be opened up. I mean, there were many, there were many stages in my acknowledgement of my heritage. Um, but they were very instrumental in that they invited me to fly to Hamburg and join them for this marvellous experience on Hidden's Day. They, they, I mean, they are young, cool, elegant, chic, uh, hamburgers. They know where to have sauna. They know where to eat perch pike. They know where the interesting museums are. They're sort of efficient, practical, straightforward, amazing young couple. And it's to them I really owe my reconnection with German literature, art, culture, uh, architecture, landscape, and their extraordinary generosity to me. Somebody has explained the lack of questions in a rather nice way, too busy absorbing. Can I avoid your question? No, no, no. Very, uh, as I get older and older, I get more and more adept at avoiding questions. No, no, that will that will do fine. So people have been busy absorbing what you've said. Um, indeed. Um, another question, actually, if you don't have to answer this, if you don't want to, but as an art historian myself, I'm, of course, very interested in Kitty, your mother. And I just wondered whether any of your work engages with her and her position in another very eminent family with an extraordinary multi, you know, layered kind of background. Well, yes. Um, when um, when she began to fail in health, I felt that I'd been much too nasty to her. And oh, many daughters experienced that process because I felt I had not acknowledged the complexity of her life. And she was absolutely adamant that I got it and I got it and I resisted it. And so, Something happened and I decided that every year I would take her away on a holiday. We would go to Norwich, um, stay in some nice place, eat out, drink gin, go and see um, local museums of interest or go to Sussex where she was brought up or some other interesting place uh, where she had strong family connections and then after she died in 2011 I had an enormous cache of unopened letters from her because she used to write to me very very regularly maybe twice or even three times a week and so I began to read these letters and um a lot of those appear in my book, The Mirror Bells, and um, my perspective on her changed from being somebody who had mastered and controlled me and manacled me to a school of aesthetics. And I, I wrote a whole series of poems uh, dedicated to her memory and her influence on me. Thank you. Um, still very few questions, but here's one from Jacqueline Hobson. Um, for readers, it's a great and enlightening pleasure to hear a poet reading her own work. Do you consider this an important part of your role? No, <laughs> not at all. And yet you enjoy doing it. Yes, I think that comes. Uh, well, it, it's about the core. It's it, to me, it's about the core of the subject matter. 
I don't see I have a responsibility to present my father or my mother or Francis Bacon or blah 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 anyone at all. It's about it's about moments where my subject matter calls me to respond. And this is why I believe that a poet's subject matter is not really with a now remit to determine. It is not, it is not. One has to um one has to um as it were assume a kind of modesty when the subject matter itself presents itself to you as willing. Okay, another question just came in from Sandy Solomon. Would you like to talk about your process of revision? Answer this is somebody you know. Yes, oh that's, that's a fabulous question. Oh, well, there's a poem in my book called the, the Levite and the Concubine. That poem was about a, a three-year process in the writing because I wasn't what I do in that poem is I link a very horrific um, episode in Judges in the Bible to an experience I had as a very young mother in Champagne in France where I my husband, my first husband's family were located. So I slightly lost my thread. What are you asking me? It's about the process of revision. Oh yeah, and it's about, it's about, for me, when I wrote that poem, uh, it started off, like, there were bits that weren't ranty enough. There were bits that were too ranty. Um, I, I was, I lived in France at a, a, during the domination of Giscard d'Estaing. This was post 1968 France with the fights on the streets and the rebels of the students and the workers and so on and the sleeping on the streets and the sort of culture of a kind of mass liberation. And then what happened is the whole thing just quietened down. You had to earn your living. You had to go back to your apprenticeship. You didn't have the fucking choice. Um, you were regarded as of why you a miscreant, a fucked up, a drunk, a sort of like, uh, yeah, and the, I used to go with the gang that I had at that time to supermarkets and just like in Bertrand Blier's film, Les Valseurs, we used to steal bottles of spirits and put them in a, in a trolley and simply e exit with uh, liquor to kind of fell an army and no one would stop us. And the cynicism that dominated that period when the promise of a new order had been uh, announced and I was within that, I was within that um, and I watched all those films and I used to go, we, there was something called Le Centre de la Culture et de la Jeunesse and every city had one and for like threepence you could get into the cinema and watch the new, amazing, shocking, cruel, funny, bizarre films being made about their time. And yet I was not of that time. I was a sort of... Um, uh, uh, 
sub, um, who was um, Serge Gainsbourg lover during that time. You know. Francoise Hardy? No, no. My, uh, I mean, Birkin. <laughs> I yeah, Birkin. Okay. Uh, and people used to talk, people used to call me Birkin. <laughs> because one of the things that she did is that she brought a undisciplined female Anglo perspective on female sexuality in love. And she was majorly shocking. And she used to appear on a TV show called Le Grand Teixiquier, where all the great chansonniers of France appeared. And she would appear in a black dress, whacking her ass on a grand piano to the, while Serge played the songs. So I was regarded as a sort of Anglo-Saxon fuckwitch, basically, although I was very well behaved. <laughs> I'm sure we could go on, Annie, but there's a rather nice question from Matthew. Hold on, let me have just lost it again. Yes, Matthew Cayley. Um, uh, hello, darling. You've described yourself brilliantly as a predatory child. Is there something predatory about being a poet? That's to say, swooping down on objects and images. Oh, I mean, is the Pope a Catholic? Someone's only got to ring you up and they tell you about a place that makes bitter cherries and immediately you're going, me, bitter cherries, I want bitter cherries. Or you read about a place in Slovenia where there are forests of hazelnut trees and immediately some uh, feisty aggressive aspect of your will wants you to wants you wants to be taken there um so um that's been very present for me for a long time and sometimes when i'm talking to people i'm close to i have to say you know be careful of the marvelous things you tell me because i will steal them <laughs> lock stock and smoking barrel <laughs> Jackie, the evening's drawing on. Um, I wondered if you wanted to uh, add anything. There was one other question which would bring me neatly to sort of begin to round things off, but Jacqueline, over to you if you'd like to say a few more words. Um, I, I don't think there's anything much else that I want to say, except that I could, you know, I could probably spend a week in Annie's company with her just telling me these, these stories, you know, and it would continue to be totally riveting. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Annie was hoping to read um, the first Do You Know Elegy, um, at the end of the Q&A as a way of closing the event um, and, I, and we could have a look at the photograph of Wilka's tomb at the same time and she yes. maybe will introduce it and explain why she wants to read it so that, that's my only contribution for now yeah. but thanks for the great questions I've so much enjoyed the questions yeah wonderful okay that's shark if we can move on there we go to yeah okay well Ooh. shark was for quite a number of years president of um, the Rilke Society and when I first began to get to know his poems uh, Rilke was the poet he most reminded me of and last year I had the privilege of visiting uh, Rilke's tomb. It's in a village in the Valais, rather grim in a way in the sense that the whole landscape is covered with shards of grey slate and it's very silent and that the walk up to his tomb in the church churchyard is steep and demanding but luckily once you've done that there is an amazing minute cafe offering the most wonderful cafe coffee and I would like to before we say goodbye to read my favorite translation of this first small part of Rilke's first edition. 
What angel, if I called out, would hear me? And even if one of them impulsively embraced me, I'd be crushed by its strength, for beauty is just the beginning of a terror we can barely stand. We admire it because it calmly refuses to crush us. Every angel terrifies. And so I control myself, choking back the dark impulse to cry. But who then could help us? Not angels, nor men. And the animals have already noticed that we aren't really at home in our talked about world. So we're left with, say, some tree on a hillside. One that we see every day. We're left with yesterday's troll and the pampered loyalty of an old habit that liked us so much it decided to stay and never left. So, I think... Yes, shall we, shall we begin to say our goodbyes? Um, more people always start typing in vigorously just towards the end. Um, mostly, yes, wonderfully complimentary. And I think what I'll do is, is send you a copy, a transcript of the chat so you can enjoy the comments um, at, a, at a later date. Perhaps I could just uh, round things off by saying that several people have, I think, quite rightly um, commented on the sort of very intimate and rather gorgeous physical, physicality of your books, and certainly this is a case in point. And I have managed to persuade Blackwells to offer a discount on the book for two weeks from today. And what I'll do is email everybody who's signed up for the event with the um, link that allows you to access that. See, I think you'll be pleased to know that if you don't already um, possess the book yourselves. I'd also, and again, I'll send you the links um, separately. Um, I was interested to come across and very moved to hear um, Annie talking uh, it was a prose, it was a, it was a, a talk, a lecture of sorts, about both her grandmother and also her father to some extent, on the website of the Irish Museum of Modern Art, um, which has, uh, it's an ongoing project, I think, isn't it, um, Annie, called the Freud Project, and um, also you reading, it's a recording of you reading Hiddensee, which will I think be nice for people to have access to later as well. Um, I'd also finally just like to say that yes, this uh, has been recorded. I think <laughs> the, te the, the technology is, is working and it will be uploaded fairly soon in the next few days, certainly within the week to the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel, which you can easily find on Google. And on there already is a wonderful presentation given by Sophie Herxheimer, who's another, and I think Jacqueline, you know her quite well, another wonderfully vivid evoker of these complicated histories. And also, last but not least, I'd just like to say that this event is part of an ongoing series of online events. And on the 14th of June, we're going to have an event by a much younger, dare I say it, a younger and you know, emerging poet called Maya Elsner, who will be talking both about her own work, which relates in interesting ways to her family's history, but also about her grandfather, Holocaust survivor, Polish-born um, visual artist called Dante Elsner. So 14th of June at 8 p.m. But if you go to the Insiders Outsiders Festival website and look in the What's On section, you'll see that there's a whole array of, I think, rather interesting and diverse events in store. So it only remind, remains for me to say a big thank you, obviously, to Annie and to Jacqueline and to the rest of you for being here. Annie, you were going to end in a sort of less formal way, but I think it might be a little tricky to do that in the virtual world. So I think we'll, we'll leave it at that for today. Many thanks. Thank you for being with us. And I look forward perhaps to seeing you at other events in the future. Look after yourselves and good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>